In the previous couple of videos, we've been looking at trusty powers, and specifically, we were looking at this main power that they have, and that is the power of investment. And this video leads on from this discussion about their powers and the power of investment. And specifically, trustees have a duty to disregard their personal, ethical, and political considerations. So when you're exercising your power of investment, you have to disregard these three considerations, your personal considerations, your ethical considerations, and your political considerations. So you must subordinate your own beliefs and do what is best for the trust. So we have this case of Cohen and Scargill from 1985, and in this case, the defendant Scargill was the president of the Mine Workers Union and a trustee of the Miners' Pension Fund. And the Miners' Pension Fund had an investment plan which included investments in South Africa and into the oil industry. And Scargill felt that investing the Miners' uh, Pension Fund in oil companies which were in direct competition with the coal industry was not in the beneficiaries' best interest. Scargill, um, sorry, he therefore proposed that the Pension Fund withdraw its investments in this area and also divest itself of its South African investments on political grounds as the apartheid was going on. So in other words, Scargill, despite the investment plan, did not think that it could possibly be in the best interest of the members of the Miners' Pension Fund to invest into, the, into South Africa or the oil industry. And it was held uh, that the, a trustee had a duty to maximise the return on the fund that he was administering, and that it was not up to the defendant, Scargill, to reject the investment advice on the basis that he had a political, ethical, or personal consideration to the investment. So if the advice, as it was here under the Miners' Pension Fund, was that South Africa and the oil industry were good investment opportunities, he, Scargill, could not disagree with that advice on the grounds that he had a political, ethical or moral objection to investing in these areas. So the court said that it is the, tr it is the uh, duty of the trustee to maximise the return. So if that means investing in something that seems to go against your personal, ethical or political beliefs, then that doesn't matter. The trust must profit. And Specifically, uh, McGarry held that when the purpose of the trust is to provide financial benefits for the beneficiaries, the best interests of the beneficiaries are their best financial interests. Therefore, the duty of the trustee to act in the best interests of the beneficiaries is to generate the best available return on the trust fund, regardless of other considerations. The irony is that, in relation to the moral nature of the obligations on the trustee to deal equitably with the trust fund, the trustee is not permitted to bring decisions of an ethical nature to bear on the scope of the investment powers. Now, as the Lordship puts it, trustees may even have to act dishonourably, though not illegally, if the interests of their beneficiaries require it. Thus, there is a positive duty to invest regardless of ethics. Yet, McGarry in this case was expressly prepared to accept that a sui juris set of beneficiaries with, a strict, uh, with stri strict views on moral matters, for example, condemnation of alcohol, would be entitled to prevent the trustee from investing in companies involved in the production of alcohol, thus suggesting that ethics can control uh, investment powers. So trustees must exercise their investment powers so as to yield the best return, putting aside personal investments, sorry, personal interests and social and political views. If investments in, for example, armaments or tobacco were beneficial, they must not refrain because of their own views, however sincere. Okay, so that's Cohen Escargo, and we've also got this case of Harry's and Church Commissioners from 1993 and I would recommend that you read this case. So this case recognises the conflict that can occur between the trustee's personal views and the requirement to make money for the trust. And this case, you know, tempers the decision 
in Cohen and Scargill to show that trustees can make investments guided by ethical considerations if it can be shown that overall financial performance would not be harmed, but also it would be consistent with the purpose of the trust. Now, in this case, the plaintiff claimed that the commissioners, whose purpose was to promote the Christian faith through the Church of England, should not invest in a manner incompatible with, the pur- with that purpose, even if this involved uh, a risk of significant financial detriment. So the church commissioners operated an ethical investment policy which, among other things, avoided investments in companies whose main business was armaments, gambling, alcohol, tobacco and newspapers. And it was held that they could take non-financial ethical considerations into account only insofar as they could do so without jeopardising the profitability of investments. And Sir Donald Nichols said that where property is so held, prima facie the purpose of the trust will be best served by the trustee seeking to obtain therefrom the maximum return, whether by way of income or capital growth, which is consistent with commercial prudence. That is the starting point for all charitable, all charity trustees when considering the exercise of their investment powers. Most charities need money, and the more of it there is available, the more the trustees can seek to accomplish. So in other words, the court said that the purpose of the trust will be best served if they are making the maximum returns they can. So this is the starting point for all charitable trustees when considering the exercise of their investment powers. In other words, the more money they make for the trust, the better. So even if you have ethical considerations, it is important to remember that your main duty is to get the maximum return. However, he recognised in some cases the position is not so straightforward. Much cited examples are those of cancer research charities and tobacco shares, trustees of temperance charities and brewery and distillery shares and trustee, and sorry, and charities, sorry, and trustees of charities of the Society of Friends and shares in companies engaged in production of armaments. If, as would be likely in those examples, trustees were satisfied that investing in a company engaged in a particular type of business would conflict with the very objects their charity is seeking to achieve, they should not so invest. Carried to its logical conclusion, the trustee should take this course even if it would be likely to result in significant financial detriment to the charity. So a common example where there is ethical considerations for a trustee is where there is a cancer charity. Okay? It is unlikely a trustee of such a charity will want to invest in tobacco shares. So the court said that in such a situation, the trustees should not invest in it because it would be in direct conflict with the object the charity seeks to achieve. So a religious or a health charity need not therefore invest in tobacco or armament. So this case is is an exception to the principle of what was established in Cohen and Scargill. However, the court made it clear that the greater the risk of financial detriment, the clearer the trustees need to be of the advantage to the charity of the court of action they were of sorry of the course of action they were taking. Okay? So if they are, you know, taking a slightly uh, bigger risk with, with regards to the finances of the trust, then they must be much clearer as to what advantages that does bring to the charity itself. Also, clearly, holding of a particular investment might hamper a charity's work by making potential recipients of aid unwilling to be helped because of the source of the charity's money or by alienating some of those who support the charity financially. Now, um, Nichols continued, trustees may, if they wish, accommodate the views of those who consider that on moral grounds, a particular investment would be in conflict with the objects of the charity, so long as the trustees are satisfied that course would not involve a risk of significant financial detriment. But when they are not so satisfied, trustees should not make investment decisions on the basis of preferring one view of whether uh, on moral grounds an investment conflicts with the objects of the charity over another. 
So it is more important the charity is making its money than its ethical requirements. So the court in this case ultimately says that it's okay to not want to invest in things that are the opposite of the uh, views or purpose of the trust. For example, you can invest in things which are opposite to the purpose of the charity if you have a charity trust. The trust must profit even if the investment goes against the ethical or political purpose of the trust. So you can have an ethical investment strategy so long as the trust profits. And we've also got this case of Buttle and Saunders. Okay, Now, in this case, trustees were selling a house which was occupied on a lease. The current occupier had, um, had made an offer for the freehold of £6,000. One of the beneficiaries of the trust heard that the house was for sale and made a higher offer. As the sale to the leaseholder was well advanced, the trustees rejected the offer. The court noted that the decision made by the trustees redounded to their credit, but their duty to their trustees meant that they were bound to consider any serious offer, and in circumstances which made it clear that sale to the higher bidder was likely to go through, they should have accepted the higher offer. In the event, the house was sold to the occupier, who made a further offer of £6,600. So the court notes the commercial obligation of the first offer on the house, which is well advanced, but said that they were still at a stage where they could consider other offers. So the trustee's obligation is first and foremost to the trust, and therefore need to take the higher offer, even if that means discrediting yourself commercially. You need to take the offer that will yield the highest profit for the trust. So the court told the trustees to go back on the first offer and take the highest offer. In the end, the original person made a high offer so the trustees were able to take that offer and therefore still go with the first person. So the important thing to remember from this case is that the court said if you are not so far advanced so that you can't pull back from the deal, then you must take the most profitable option for the trust. In other words, maximise the benefit for the trust that will override your commercial responsibility. And finally, we have ethical investments. Now, many organisations and individuals have adopted ethical investment strategies. These strategies are available to trustees as long as the strategy does not reduce the return available. The onus is on the trustees to satisfy themselves that the return on, on investments is not compromised by the strategy. So ethical investment strategies are okay so long as the trust is profiting. And we have this uh, quote from the Charity Commission in the Charities and Investment Matters, a guide for trustees, which says that in the case of charities, they may adopt investment strategies on the grounds that there is a conflict between the commercial activity and the charitable objects, or that the charity invests in a particular sector may discourage donors, supporters or beneficiaries. In some cases, it might be legitimate for a charity to invest in a company in order to use its shareholding as a means of influencing the company to change its activity as a means for the charity to achieve its charitable objects. So this is a guide for the trustees in relation to charitable trust. And this quote notes the issue whereby if a cancer charity trustee, for example, invests in tobacco shares, the charity may lose supporters and donors. But this says that there may be a legitimate reason for investing in a tobacco company as a cancer charity, for example, to get a large enough shareholding so as to influence decision making within the company rather than just a profit. OK, so that is the end of this video. And that almost brings to the end the discussion on investment powers. I may talk about in the next video the standard and breach of trust with regards to the investment powers and power of investment and also a bit more about the delegation of powers before we move on to talking about further trustees powers. But if you have any questions at all about this particular video, then please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. If you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.